Well, today we're going to talk Christians and the upcoming election. Most of us have been warned to avoid the topic of politics, and I've been urged countless times, don't preach on politics, just preach Jesus. And I bet there's not one of you who are going to hear me today uh, that is envious and wishing it were you that's preaching this message. Uh, I've wrestled with it as well, uh, but the Holy Spirit has made it clear the Lord expects it from me. If you're in my church or if you're a Christian uh, watching this, you're accountable for the truths of the scripture. Uh, And God has released me from any burden of trying to change anyone's mind. I, I, I don't set out to do that. He has told me merely to hold believers accountable, to speak the truth and leave accountability Uh, between each believer and the Lord himself. So I want to express my love in this message. I want to express that I preach it fearfully and hopefully humbly. And I am convinced that the message will be clear and that Christians will be better for hearing it as you consider your decisions for this election season. Now, be prepared. There is a ton of material. God told me to preach the message. He didn't make me do a series, thank goodness. So we're going to get it all in today. today. So uh, buckle up your belt and uh, get ready to go. Let's jump in. I want to start today with three questions a Christian should ask. The first question is, does God call me to vote? In both Genesis 1 and in the Psalm 8 passages, it makes makes it clear that God created humanity to fill the earth, to rule over all the earth, everything in it, and to subdue everything under our feet. And then when Paul was instructing the young preacher, Timothy, he addressed him with these words in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. First of all, then I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. He told the young preacher Timothy to petition God, to be praying to God, to intercede, to to offer thanksgiving for kings and rulers and those in authority. And he said the result is so that we could live a tranquil and quiet life, that we could live in all godliness, we could live in dignity. In America, since we are directly responsible for who our king or who our president is, since we put them in office, uh, instead of uh, them coming into office some other way, we are accountable as though we would be the king ourselves, in my opinion. Look at the second question we're to ask. Who has my heart? Everyone is saying this is the most important election ever, and we're panicked about the thought of the other candidate uh, winning. And in Jesus' days, the Jews were oppressed by Roman rulers. They were slaves, and, and they were under an extremely burdensome system and taxation. And the people we're dealing with, should we rebel? Should we follow them? Should we refuse to pay taxes to an evil government or pay taxes? And so they presented that to Jesus. And in Mark 12, you can read that later, but Jesus summed it up by saying, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Jesus pushed a revolutionary way that Christians were to relate to government He says, listen, Caesar's image is stamped on the coin. And so Jesus acknowledged that pertaining to this world, those were Caesar's. They belonged to Caesar's. Uh, But where is God's image stamped? In Genesis 1, it's very clearly stated that God's image is stamped on every single human heart. We are created in his image. We live in a realm run by human rulers, but Christ and his kingdom ultimately should be what has our heart, what has our mind, our emotions, uh, our decisions. So when man's heart is not given to Christ, we see what happened during the trials of Jesus Christ. The religious rulers wouldn't give their heart. They were more committed to their own Jewish government and ultimately even to the Romans than they were to Jesus Christ. And during the trial of Jesus, Pilate uh, asked this question. Look in John 19, should I crucify your king? And look what the Jewish leaders who proclaimed to worship God said. They said, we have no king but Caesar. 
Now let's make it very clear today that Jesus, not Biden, not Trump, not Democrats, not Republicans, should be at the center of our heart, our hope, and our faith if we're a Christian. I believe God's desire today is to assess just how deeply he has the trust, allegiance, hope, and ultimately the heart of every single believer. The third question we should start with, I think, is just a more practical one. What can I learn from God's instructions to Israel and their kings? In Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 21, he gives six easy principles that were principles of the Old Testament for the kings who would rule over his people and I think can be applied very broadly in a way for the leaders that Christians would want to lead us. Let me just go through those real quickly. We don't have time to read that passage. You can read it later. But the first one is the nation is to follow God, seeking whom the Lord has chosen. He warns them in Deuteronomy 17, 14. He said, don't appoint a king like other nations around you, but seek to appoint exactly the king God has selected. And then secondly, he said the king is to be chosen from among his people, not a foreigner. He wanted them to have been raised in Jewish culture and in the scriptures of God and not an outsider who knew nothing about their country and their people. The third point is God is not to, the king is not to focus on amassing personal wealth. In verse 16 of Deuteronomy 17, he says he's not to amass multiple horses and I don't want the king to go back to Egypt to get horses from them. So I think he's saying two things. Our leader should not seek to amass wealth, and he also should not look to other foreign or pagan countries and want what they have and the security they have, the wealth they have, the things they have. Look at the fourth thing. The king is to be content with his family and not to take many wives. He's supposed to be good in his marriage. He's supposed to be content with his wife, be content in his home. In the church, if you look in 1 Timothy 3, both deacons and elders are required uh, to run their homes well, have good relationship with their wife, run their homes uh, well spiritually with their children. And he said if they can't run their home, uh, they're, they're not to run the church. And I think the same thing here. If the king is not doing well in his home, how in the world can he run a nation? Look at the fifth thing. The king's to be committed to God's word. He's to lead by God's statutes, his commands, his ordinances. And then lastly, the king is to be humble. Verse 21 it says he's not to exalt himself above the people. Now, if you look at our politicians today, how many of these six do they seem to pass on? I, I'd have my doubts, quite frankly, uh, with the vast majority of them. That leads us to the second area, which candidates most closely exemplify the Christian position. We can't possibly address this thoroughly. And again, thank the Lord he didn't call me to do a series on this. I don't want to talk on the election for weeks. Uh, but uh, we are going to look a little closer at the first one and the last two. And I would encourage you as we go through each of these, maybe you want to go and put a R for Republican or a D for Democrat. As you go through each one of these, if you're a Christian, how well do they fit these? And before, these, uh, before I look at these as well, I want to note something. I put the scripture references on your outline rather than the description under the area of what I think the scripture uh, says in a broad way. I think it's more important for you to take your outline and study and meditate on God's word, pray through God's word and vote that than it is even uh, to look at my analysis of what I think the scriptures teach on each of these. So we'll give a, a, a basic with each of these seven uh, issues we're going to briefly look at. We'll give a basic um, premise of those scripturally, uh, but I would encourage you there to go home, study the scriptures. Look at the first one. How do we deal with the important uh, issue of Christian, Christian leader, and God's blessing on the nation. Uh, note what I summarize this as. Christian leaders who follow the Lord's instructions for rulers benefit the people, bless a nation, 
and lead by a different set of values than unbelievers. In Matthew 20, 25, and 26, Jesus told his followers that Gentile rulers or unbelieving rulers would lord it over the people they ruled, that they acted like tyrants over the people. But he told his followers that if they wanted to be great as a Christian leader, they had to be a servant to the people they led. And then God told his elders, his, his shepherds, his leaders over his church in 1 Peter 5, 3, to not lord it over those entrusted to their care, but to be examples to them. You see, for a leader to lead by serving rather than lording it over people as a tyrant blesses people. Look at Proverbs 29, 2. When the righteous flourish, the people rejoice. But when wicked people rule, people groan. Oh, how we're groaning with our rulers in America right now. Our, our shoulders are heavy with the weight of foolish, prideful, unbiblical, godless decisions made uh, in both parties and by many of our leaders. And every party places the blame on the other party entirely. Our Democrats and Republicans both have failed this issue uh, that voters are considering. Look at Psalm 33, 12, and see if our Republicans and Democrats are offering this. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. Oh, may we select to the best of our ability a leader and leaders who love the Lord with all their heart, soul, and mind. Which candidate best reflects that in the, the voting you're doing? Have you even considered that? Or are you just going to vote a party? Look at number two, the second uh, issue. Gender. God clearly created people as distinct men and women in his image. And scripture is straightforward regarding, regarding the moral status of homosexual conduct. You can look at all those later. The Bible can't be any clear that God created every human as a distinct man or distinct woman. Uh, that's no less clear than that God created us human. He didn't create us birds of the air or fish of the sea or animals. And he created man and he created woman. Which candidate embraces the truth in this policy uh, the most? Look at the third issue of marriage. God clearly defines marriage as a monogamous, lifelong covenant between one man and one woman. Listen very closely. To redefine gender or marriage is to rewrite God's entire plan for humanity, his entire institution uh, of the home. A Christian should hold the position that doing justice involves defending and promoting uh, marriage according to God's definition. Which candidate defends and promotes the marriage of one man and one woman is the will of God who created us all and instituted the home and family. Look at number four, race. Race is a key issue going on in lives right now. God's word clearly teaches racial equality, that all people are made in the image of God. According to Genesis 1.27, the good news of salvation is for everyone. Jesus and in Jesus believers from every tongue Every nation, every tribe are reconciled to God and each other in, quote, one new man. According to Ephesians 2, 14 through 16, Jesus said he broke down any reason for hostility between races. He achieved reconciliation for us through salvation. There's no restitution needed. There is no emphasis on one race or another race or the color of people, all of that for Christians and any seeming hostility or expectation uh, or vengeance or anything should be left at the cross of Jesus Christ. Salvation and equal access to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus Christ and the Father should satisfy the deepest need of every man and woman regardless of your color and regardless of of circumstances going on around us. Look at this next point. The new covenant abolished distinctions based on race. 
And Jesus, the reality he said was that there's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer a slave or a free man. There's no longer male or female. We are all one and equal in Christ Jesus. And then look at our futures. In heaven, people from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, will praise God. I look for a candidate who doesn't divide us by color, but he unifies us. He treats us equal. To promote one color creates division and sometimes disunity from those of other races. It causes more conflict than healing. To promote one diminishes another. A, a top socialist strategy has always been to divide people. And if you'll just look around, our government has divided us male and female, uh, wealthy and not wealthy, and by color and those things, it is going out of its way to divide us and create hate from everybody toward one another instead of us understanding as Christians there's a oneness regardless of how much money we make, whether male or female, whether slave or free, or regardless of our color. Look at number five, poverty. God's word clearly commands care for the poor. Jesus displayed remarkable concern and compassion for the poor in his ministry. We're to love our neighbor. We're to love and protect uh, the poor and the oppressed. We're to tear down unjust structures and systems in the world. Uh, we have better help those in need. Look at the next statement. Jesus' half-brother James wrote that pure and undefiled religion includes care for orphans and widows. The final two, I consider these a especially critical for our times, our country, and our politics today. Let's hit that topic nobody wants to talk about, abortion. God's word clearly, clearly, unmistakably indicates that life begins at conception. God forms children in their mother's womb, and murder breaks one of his ten commandments. I'm going to be blunt totally apart from God, totally in a secular humanistic thinking, a woman probably can logically express why she has a right over her body. She has a right over her sexual decision. She has a right to ultimately decide regarding an unborn baby. But I want to make it equally clear. There is simply no remotely even close argument that can be used biblically, spiritually, or righteously for abortion. There is not a person who identifies with themselves as a Christian that can go in the Word of God and say they follow the Word of God and they obey God and say they can give an argument for abortion. In fact, the opposite. The Bible very clearly says the baby, the baby's names, and its plan and future are all connected to God while in the mother's wombs. Look at all these verses. Psalm 139, 13, and 14. The psalmist says, For it was you, God, who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I've been remarkably and wonderfully named. Look what the psalmist says in Psalm 22.10. I was given over to you at birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Look what the prophet Jeremiah, one of the greatest prophets ever to live, said. He said, the word of the Lord came to me. What did God say? God said, I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. God gave him a name and appointed his purpose and his plans for him, set him apart for God's work uh, while he was being formed in the womb. Look what Isaiah the prophet said, Isaiah 49, 1. The Lord called me before I was born. He named me while I was in my mother's womb. In Luke 1, 39 through 45, Elizabeth had been given the promise that the son she was carrying would be the forerunner to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ. And then shortly after, her cousin Mary 
uh, became pregnant with the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at what Luke 1, 39 through 45 reveals. John the Baptist, quote, leaped for joy, end quote, inside his mother's womb when he heard the voice of Mary who was carrying Jesus in her womb. Fathom that, the truth of that, that the forerunner to Jesus while in his mother's womb leaped for joy when he heard the voice of the woman carrying the Savior speaking to his mother. Galatians 1.15, the Apostle Paul states he was set apart and called by God for his, mother, for his ministry while still in his mother's womb. Now listen, I, I want to say something and, and say this as gently and with as deep a conviction as I can. I know people who have ha had abortions. I know people who've gone through that and dealt with great regret or guilt or depression or great sorrow later. Uh, to any of you listening, please know that God is faithful. He's just to forgive us of sin, to cleanse us for many and all unrighteousness that we confess. And confession restores righteousness. It forgives. It cleanses. It, it gives a grace beyond what we imagine and restores us to righteousness in God. But I still need to dress our society. I'm not talking to someone who's had an abortion as much as I'm warning those who will consider it. Uh, it is very deeply troubling in our society and there's a great, great, great push in a humanistic society to push for that rather than teach the words of God regarding that. Did you know that just this week the satanic temple wanted to put up billboards that showed people to have abortions? They said you can claim a religious exemption through identifying with us that will free you from waiting periods or counseling or ultrasounds or other measures required by some states. Billboards by Lamar Advertising declined to put those up, and the Satanic Temple has now sued, citing religious discrimination. How far we've fallen in our culture. And pro-abortionists are now, uh, also latest news, selling Thank God for Abortion necklaces. Oh my gosh. Our sin... In this area, cries out in a way, and I think God will say, if Sodom and Gomorrah had known what you know through the word of God and following the coming of the Savior, they'd have never started to touch some of the things you've touched as a country, how we've fallen and how God's judgment is in, in, on an increasing level is coming down our, on our country. Let me ask you, do you see God's pleasure and blessing on America right now? It's, it's not there. How could a Christian choose a candidate who would promote such a policy? Number seven, God and religious liberty. God in his word clearly teaches that every human being is accountable to him for their life. Romans 1, 20 and 14, 12 say, For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we, Christians, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in his body, whether good or evil. You see, all humanity that rejects God will face him at the great white throne, and every Christian who has embraced God through Jesus Christ will face the judgment seat of Christ. So we're going to give an account. So what do we do as we give an account from a government that's growing more and more hostile toward Christianity? Look at the next point in your outline. D Daniel. Jonathan, the apostles, among many others in the Bible, defied governing leaders who opposed God and his laws. You can read about that in the book of Daniel or 1 Samuel or Acts. Listen to what Democratic Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez claimed just this week. She said, quote, Sick and tired of Republicans who co-opt faith to advance bigotry and barbarism. 
Fact is, if today Christ himself came to the floor of Congress and repeated his teachings, many would malign him as a radical and eject him from the chamber. That's probably true. Many who are leading us hold to a form of religion and they deny the power of Jesus Christ, his kingdom, and his unalterable word of God that we're not to explain away, but we're to live by. I believe the days are fast approaching when freedom of speech and freedom of religion will be lost in this country. I think days are approaching when this sermon will be tried as hate speech. Daniel wouldn't bow to the king. Jonathan defied his own godless father, Saul the king, because he wouldn't follow God. And Paul and the apostles kept preaching, though forbidden by government, to preach Jesus. So how does your candidate fulfill or violate these seven biblical issues? Pretty clear to me. Uh, when I look, I see a very clear leaning uh, one side on this. And the thing is today, there is no pretense in America anymore that we are a Christian nation. So politicians don't try to pretend they believe Christianity and the teachings of God. They'll just tell you. They'll tell you whether they want him out of their party or whether they resent Christian, Christianity teaching the truths of God. But I think the last point is probably as important as all the issues. And I preach this to Christians. I preach it to my church. Uh, and I'm going to practice it. I have a great peace with it. Look at this last point. Regardless of political differences, we must maintain unity in Christ's church. Let me read to you Ephesians. 4, 1 through, the, through 3. Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I want to close with four last statements that are as strong as anything we've looked at today. I want you to see the first one, Jesus' prayer. While Jesus was preparing to be arrested that night, and he's teaching in the most intimate setting that he taught, he prayed the same unity as exists between the Father and the Son. Jesus prayed that Christians would have the same unity exemplified in the Trinity. Look at his prayer in John 17, 21. May they, Christians, all be one as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. Christians must love each other, remain unified with Christ, regardless of political differences or national conflicts. Look at the next point. What priority is higher than our convictions? Unity, in order to glorify our Lord Jesus. You can read Romans 15, 5 and 6 later, but it, it it shares that we need to pray that God will grant us the same mind with one another, according to Jesus Christ, so that in one accord and voice we can glorify Jesus Christ. We must accept one another just as Jesus accepted us. And I am vowed to love my brothers and sisters. I know people who are going to vote differently than me, and that does not change the unity we have in Jesus Christ, the love I know they have for Jesus Christ, our desire to experience faith in Jesus Christ. Then there's a third thing that I think you'll find interesting. God places highest attention on if final decisions made in one's mind are to honor Jesus. The Roman Christians held bitter differences. We're really, really fighting over whether they could eat certain foods or not eat certain foods. They were fighting over whether all days were the same or there were holy days that had to be kept to glorify God. But God said their final conclusions on these matters were not, was, were not what he was looking at the most. He said it was if their minds were set he was watching to see if their minds were set on honoring Jesus. Look what he says in Romans 14, 5 and 6. He says, one person judges one day to be more important than another day. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. 
Whoever observes the day observes it for the honor of the Lord. He said, if you eat, do it for the Lord's honor. If you abstain from eating, do it for the honor of the Lord as best as possible in our minds. When you vote, if your heart, with all of your heart, is doing it uh, to obedience to the scriptures and the honor of the Lord, uh, God will look in that. If our commitment is because my parents and parents' parents always voted for this way or I've always voted a certain way or there's one issue that I'm going to vote on that I don't care about everything else or if my focus isn't entirely on honoring the Lord but it's on doing what my convictions are, uh, he's going to look at our hearts through and through. And then finally, the stronger Christian should always listen, learn, and love and read Romans 15, 1 and following, we're not going to all agree today. If you or I are strong, we're mature, we're a knowledgeable Christian, if we're convinced absolutely that our political vote gives honor to the Lord, it is biblical, uh, more biblical, or whatever, so be it. If we feel someone's less knowledgeable, if they're faithful, uh, they're not as faithful, or whatever, if we consider ourselves strong, consider ourselves right, the priority is on always listening, always learning, and always loving. Well, you're going to ask these three questions. Are you open enough to change your mind based on what the Spirit of God and the Word of God teaches you? Are you willing to keep the unity of Christ in such a divisive world where we know in every single church you walk in there's going to be differing political opinions? I love you. Uh, I love the Lord. I, like you, am carrying a great burden for our country. It's overwhelming. I do not sense the strong presence of God. I do not feel the strong blessing of God in this country. I feel the circumstances uh, in our country are overwhelmingly dark and under judgment and literally opposed by God. Uh, and I feel like we're carrying a heavy weight for that. Our politicians in this election won't save us from that. But as each Christian, we're to teach the truths of God, not just within the walls of the church, but everywhere. And may God be fully blessed. In everything we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are living in the most uh, difficult of times, hard times, a difficult election, and we carry the weight of that as Christians. Every Christian, regardless of what side they would lean toward, are burdened and heavy, and our politicians uh, have deeply grieved us uh, on every side. But you are faithful and just. Keep our hearts on you, our minds in you, and may we ultimately do everything we do in obedience to your word, sensitive to your Holy Spirit, and to honor our Lord Jesus Christ to fulfill your plan. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>